Hello and welcome to Taskmaster Talks. I am a JP, a John Paz from the two man power trip of wrestling, and of course, the man, the myth, the legend, the former WCW and ECW World Tag Team Champion, the one, one of the greatest minds ever in the history of professional wrestling, the man behind the NWO, the Games Master, the Taskmaster, the devil himself, Mr. Kevin Sullivan. Kevin, how are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great, John. How are you? Doing very good. And I just wanted to first start off because I got a message from Hannibal, and he had a question for you that he wanted me to pass forward. So got to ask you this. I mean, if, if uh, Devin's asking, Hannibal's asking, you got to come through. So here we go. A radio host years ago insulted you big time at the radio station. So you decide to show up at the radio station and confront him after he called you small, wimpy, and some a few other things. Is this a work or a shoot or what happened here? And, and why is this guy calling you out over the radio? It was I guess shoot. it was somewhere in the Keys. It was a shoot, and he had a radio station in Miami. You know, the Keys are like uh, an hour away from Miami. Miami, and he was a half-assed friend of mine too. And I heard it, and uh, it, as luck would have it, a couple of days later, I'm flying out, and I'm going I'm in Miami, and I see him. And I went up to him, you know, and I had a little talk with him. But it was definitely a shoot. And if Hannibal asked, Hannibal should be heard, because one of the things about Kim John, I don't know if you've watched him ever in a match. He's one of the most intense guys I've ever seen. And why he didn't get to work for a big company, I understand the deal that happened with Abdullah and him, that he had the WWE job, and then they took it away because he got hepatitis C. But now he's took the cure, and he's cured. And... Uh, he is not only a student of the business, he's one of those guys that really loves the business. He was a fan. He's like me and you, you know what I mean? We grew up being wrestling fans. Yep. And I, I, I just think, I, I think the world of him because he looks the part, he talks the part, he does MMA. He, I mean, he's in fabulous shape and I got to hand it to him. Doesn't he have like a hundred million people that have tuned into him? So he gets a be, lot. He, he got to be doing something right, John. I think we're only 999 and 99 million away. <laughs> He uh, he definitely he does he does a, a great job. And today, what I wanted to talk about in this episode, uh, a few people messaged me, and I think I got a message on Twitter about this. Uh, I think yesterday or the other day, it was very very uh, soon, or it wasn't that long ago. Everyone kind of wanted to know why the radicals, aka the revolution, left the WCW and went to the WWF at that point and i just kind of what's like the first thing that it just, just pops your mind when i say radicals or revolution leaving wcw headed to wwf they were great talent it hurt very much the company it hurt very much the company i mean those guys had a symbiotic relationship you know with the they were just below the main event they were going to come into their own uh, I don't think they trusted me when I took the book over. Uh, uh, it's an unfortunate thing that maybe it was because of me that they lost those guys. And, uh, you know, I made Benoit the world heavyweight champion. And people think, oh, yeah, that's an easy thing to do. Go into a room with Sid Vicious, who's 6'7", 320 pounds, and tell him that he's going to drop a strap to a guy 5'7", 250. And the other thing is I made Eddie the cruiserweight heavyweight, a cruiserweight champion. Then at the same time that he held the belt, he became the U.S. champion, heavyweight champion. And I wanted to show that cruiserweights could wrestle heavyweights, just like, a, you know, a big boxing fan. Just like when Bob Foster fought Ali, he was the light heavyweight champion of the world. Archie Moore fought uh, Floyd Patterson and Rocky Marciano when he was the light heavyweight champion. And I was trying to go there. And if 
if do you know who Bob Mold is? Who's oh called? yeah, he was a part of WWE Creative uh, at one point. Yeah. I read Bob's book, and Bob has no bones to pick. We the next week we're going to make Malenko and Satin the uh, tag team champions because all of them deserved it. They were fabulous workers. I feel that you know. I can't get into people's heads and people can't get into my heads. But I was going for a big push with them. And the other reason why I was pushing them, the guys that were on top, there was a little bit of ego problem. We could talk about some people said, you know, they were too small and couldn't draw. But they gave the best performances on the card 99.9% .9 of the time. And losing those guys really hurt. It really did hurt uh, quite a bit. And I think that was the beginning of the downfall because take those guys in the equation, the show is not going to be anywhere near as good as when we had them. And uh, as Bob said, you know, we had plans for them, and I guess they didn't think I had plans. And that's why I made Benoit the champion. He deserved it. And... The guys on top, like Hogan, started to want to work with the Benoit's and the Satins and Malenko's. So, uh, it was a, a crushing blow to us, and it was a crushing, crushing blow to the company, that's for sure, because they went on to bigger and better things, and they were very, very talented. Now, as far as some of the other guys, Kevin Nash has notoriously said that those guys are vanilla midgets and they can't draw and has said comments. I know he years later has kind of come back on that a bit and said how great Eddie was and how great Benoit was and things like that. But when they come to you and they say vanilla midgets and, and these guys can't do that, well, how do you kind of take that? Well, they're also talking to a guy that's 5'8". You know? <laughs> so <laughs> I'm kind of hearing it, you know, like Wait a minute, guys. You know, I, I, Kevin, I'm not seeing eye level with you. I'm seeing your belly button. And, you know, I think on both sides, there was a misunderstanding. Because, as you know, John, in the wrestling business, and I'm not talking about the click, but there are clicks. And those guys were in their click. The Hogan's and NWO group were their cliques, and then there was other cliques. So it would have been nice to think that we all could be objective and see what those guys brought to the table. And I mean, I could have, I could see that those guys could have had a match with anybody at the time. And, uh, in fact, I had Benoit wrestle the giant one time. And he went to get his jacket off. And the jacket was held and the giant, the bell rang and the giant came out and choke slammed him. But his arms were pinned back into his head. And the angle was, well, did they do it on purpose to him? And I was trying to uh, show that there could have been a match there later on because he was so intense. I mean, they were all were intense, and they were all incredibly good performers. But on the other hand, they went there, meaning the WWE, and really succeeded. So maybe at this time, in all actuality, there was a log jam on top. I mean, I'll go through the people. You had Hogan, Nash, Hall. Randy, Sting, the Steiners, Luger, Flair, Arn, Barry Windham, uh, Brian Pillman. And Pillman had come up from those ranks, and then he, he crossed over too, you know what I mean? He was a main eventer with WCW, and then he took the loose cannon angle. It was a huge success in ECW and WWE. So I think those guys, they was going to come. But those guys got, you know, antsy and rightfully so. 
And the funny thing is, some of them now that are uh, the age that the guys that I just mentioned are that age and they still have, I'm talking about Hunter and Jericho, they're still on top. And those guys still would have been on top. So at this point, obviously, the, the radicals are Eddie Guerrero, Chris Benoit, Dean Malenko, um, Perry. And Perry Saturn. Yep, how can I forget about Perry Saturn? So those are the four guys. Those are the four radicals, um, Benoit, Malenko, Saturn, and Guerrero. In the, in the revolution, the WCW faction take out Eddie and replace him with Shane Douglas. So obviously Shane does not make the jump over the WWF. He ends up staying. But we'll kind of get into that in a minute, but just want to kind of set the stage of what's going on here. He was rumored to be headed out as well in this whole thing. Now, how do you kind of get back into power how do you become the booker again because russo is the booker at, at this point as the revolution those guys are, are getting a push and eddie guerrero separately before he gets injured i believe it's um november late november of 99 where he kind of gets injured um and it, another interesting kind of thing i'll bring up later is about billy kidman and all those guys but i'll bring that up later um so you have the revolution getting pushed by uh, russo but kind of push not push it's kind of it's weird. It's like they were going to get a big push, then not. But then they started kind of getting on a roll a little bit. Eddie with the filthy animals for the injury was was on a bit of a roll. Seemed like Russo was trying to get rid of Flair. Seemed like Russo was that's trying to get rid of Hogan. Yep. You know, I mean, you don't have to be uh, Freud to figure out when they buried Rick in the desert what they were trying to do. The underlining move was whoever came up with that idea was burying flair they want to get rid of him and uh you know and i had talked to rick about a week ago and we were laughing i said do you realize rick i just seen his skittle commercial with new day which i loved i said they've been trying to get rid of you since 1989 you're like dracula they don't know how to drive the stake in <laughs> They don't have a Van Helsing to get rid of them. So, I mean, and that's, I think, what brought me back to the forefront was the people. Here's the thing a lot of people and our fans don't understand. When Vince makes a decision, it's Vince's decision completely. When Turner executives were seeing that in the desert, they're saying, you're going to bury a guy that's make, is probably the third or second highest paid guy in the company. This doesn't make sense. Anymore. So, you know, we heard the clamoring from them too. You know what I'm saying? It was like a lot of times, not a lot, but a few times I got called in and said, why did the guy that's making three times the amount of money as the other guy lose? And this was not the wrestling division. This was the accounting division and the lawyer. And I have to explain to him how wrestling worked. Vince doesn't have to do that. He can do anything he wants. And as we went deeper into a transition of the television program becoming cops and uh, Viagra the pole matches and things like that. We started to open the door for criticism from the North Tower who wrote the check. So that's how I, I believe I got in the position back to be the booker. Now, Russo has stated that he did not want to kill off Flair, even though it, it literally seems like he was killing him off. Uh, he says he was not uh, he was not killing off Hogan, but obviously Hogan uh, lays down for Sting. We kind of don't see him for a while uh, until you, you know you kind of come back. So it does seem like the bigger names are kind of being written off a little bit. So maybe those guys like the Revolution and stuff might be getting a, a bit of a push. But obviously, this is around the same time where Bret Hart's going to be world champion. Goldberg is obviously still a major, major player, major main main eventer. Um, I mean, there's there's just a lot of uh, big stars still there and still going jeff jarrett of course uh is, is still a main eventer there so it's, it's just to me it's like 
these guys seem like they were just not happy kind of with their spots, despite all those top guys ahead of them. Was that something that, that would always happen? Like, do they always, you know, maybe even before Russo, during Russo, do they come at some and say, hey, you know, we don't like our spot. We Those four guys specifically, we want a better spot. Not those guys specifically, but everybody thinks they they need a spot. And, and you know, we, we, you know, I forgot Goldberg and uh, I forgot Jarrett. And then, and then there was a match with Jarrett and Hogan that caused quite a stir, whether it was a, whether that promo with Russo and Hogan were real, but supposedly there was a lawsuit, wasn't there? Yep. So I'm assuming they wouldn't have a lawsuit unless it was real. And, you know, we mentioned all those other guys, but there's a guy we always kind of uh, don't bring up, and I always thought he was talented, headed to uh, greener pastures, was Buff Bagwell. Buff had his gimmick down. Could you name four guys in the company that looked as good as Buff? Nope. To me, Buff was a diamond in the rough. And so there was a log jam of great talent. And for, th for them, their decision, I think, if I look at this as individuals, it was the right decision for them to make because they walked across probably got huge salaries and were pushed because Vince needed top talent and they were top talent. And they walked right in in a great position. I thought the angle that Vince did with them sitting in the audience was fabulous. And again, I don't want to harken back to this, but there was a creative control issue too that Vince had total creative control. You know what I mean? So we didn't have to run something else by somebody else. Now, as far as kind of like, where were you as Russo was in charge in, in late 99 and he's doing the powers that be and, and he's the booker and everything else. Where are you at that point? I was in the uh, office and I would come to the show and, you know, as you, if you recall what I said to JJ uh, when we had him on the program, I went to him one day and I said, are you seeing what I'm seeing? This looks like uh, a pilot for a sitcom. For, was it a rope opera they were going to do? Mm -hmm. And to me, you know, we went from fans fighting in the audience Ha ha. I remember, uh, here's something funny. I remember when, was it the Harlem Heat threw the pasta and meatballs on the Italian guys? <laughs> yep. And I went to JJ and I said, You're going to hear from the Italian Defamation League, I'm telling you. And they might have thought I called them, I think, because the next day they got a they got a message. I mean, we were going from we were going from weed and Jack Daniels to cookies and milk. And our audience at the time were rabid fans that were into the leaving the willing suspension at the door of disbelief at the door and buying wrestling at that three hour block that they were watching maybe afterwards and maybe before but they could check check out the you know that like they were watching a marvel movie that this was real as it was happening there wasn't cutting back in the stage there wasn't a movie actor winning the world title there wasn't a guy that was not uh, had never been in the ring become the world heavyweight champion there was no Viagra in the pole match. There was no stripping dresses off. It was, at that time, it was going back to heat. And nobody's right, John, about how to book 
because if there was, you and I would turn to page 40 and say, okay, we're a year into this. What do we do? Okay, turn to page 40, John. That will tell us what to do. It's everybody's opinion, and everybody should have an opinion, and sometimes you need to change it up, and sometimes you need to change it up dramatically, but something that serious as the NWO when you had fans fighting in the audience against one another, the only thing I can equate this to is what the country is going through now. We got two sides, right? We talked about this. We got two sides, and they're fighting one another. That's what was going on back then. Fans that were flares were showing up in suits and ties, and the fans that were NWO were going too sweet, you know, and popping for Nash and Hall because if I look at it, and put myself back in that time period of someone being 25. They wanted either to be riding in limos and jet flying with Ric Flair and having kamikazes, or they wanted to be with Hall, Nash, Kid, and Hogan having beers on the back of big bikes. So it was a whole different dichotomy. And I think that when we turn that way, and again, this is no disrespect to anybody, they had their own opinion, that it kind of shut the guys that had kind of built wrestling, especially Ric Flair. You know, my hats are off to Ric Flair. Nobody, in my opinion, has ever worked as hard as Ric Flair. And it shows he's still a draw. I mean, did you see the thing with the pro football players in the locker room doing Rick's interview in front of him? Yep. Uh, Rick's 70 years old and they're still into Ric Flair. To me, that's the most amazing thing I have ever seen in my life, how he has transcended generations. It's completely, to me, crazy that he's been able to do that. So, burying Ric Flair in the desert, I don't care what anybody says. If you didn't do it intentionally, boy, you uh, need to lay down and look at your dreams because subconsciously you did it intentionally. And he was sending a message to the guys that he wanted to rally around, you know, uh, it was sort of, and not completely the same, it was sort of like when I was working for ECW and Terry Funk and I'd be in the dressing room, Paulie Gate would give the greatest Newt Rockney speeches of all times. He would have those guys ready to run through the wall, and rightfully so. He did an amazing job, and he's still doing an amazing job. But Terry and I would look at each other and kind of, roll our eyes to one another because he was a great psychologist, Paulie. So maybe that's where that was coming from. He wanted to have a band of guys on their side. And uh, who knows what would have happened if it continued. Maybe they would all bump the other guys out of positions. Who knows? It's one of those things... We'll never know because it never happened. Now, one of the interesting things that happens in the end of 99 before Russo would leave in, in, in 2000 is the return of the varsity club. So you're going to come out of retirement here. You, Rick Steiner, Mike Rotundo, Leia Meow is going to be your manager, and you guys are going to redo the varsity club. Dr. Death is there as well, but he's not really in, he's not in the varsity club. He's more with Oklahoma, who's Ed Ferrara playing the, the Jim Ross character, which is interesting. All the guys are back together. How did you get kind of get coerced out of coming out of retirement? Well, they asked me to do it, and uh, I, I wasn't, you know, a hundred percent for it because I wasn't in the best shape of my life. And they asked me to do it, and I've always felt that I was a team player. And I said, "Yeah, I'll do it," but it was only for that one match. And if you remember. I did one move in, you know, China, 
who I knew before she was a wrestler. We lived in the Asia. same town. Yeah, uh, Asia, rather. I'm sorry. How did I blow that? Asia. Uh, you know, she lived in the same town that Kevin and I did, and she's a wonderful person. And I did one move in the match, and then didn't we turn on uh, Jim Duggan? Yep. Yeah, so, I mean, I didn't see how Duggan fit into the Varsity Club, first of all, but we turned on him. But that was a one-time deal, deal, one time deal for me, yeah. Yeah, that was weird with Duggan being kind of thrown in there. Uh, and obviously, yeah. Dr. Death fights Vampiro on that card, and then Oklahoma fights Vampiro and involved in that feud. But yeah, Duggan kind of didn't make sense, and then you guys turn on Duggan. Kind of doesn't really lead anywhere. Uh, obviously, the, who you wrestled was uh, Douglas, Saturn, Benoit, and Asia Revolution gets the, the victory uh, there. Uh, or well, I believe, actually, I'm sorry, it was Malenko in, involved as well. But it, it was just one of those things where it's like, Man, uh, I don't know like why they were doing it, or or if there was an end game. Was there an end game with that, or I, no? I don't think so because that was the last time I got in the ring, you know. And uh, you know, sometimes, and this is again no knock. Sometimes you throw something in there hoping it will work, but Doctor Death fit with us because he had been with us, and if you look at when you had the original Varsity Club, when it was Dan Spivey, off and on. It was Dr. Death, off and on, but it was Rotundo and Steiner. With those four guys, I might have challenged Barbarian, not Ming, but maybe Barbarian. I mean, those guys were all great shooters, tough guys, and they added credibility to the card, that's for sure. You know what I mean? And again, this sounds like I'm nitpicking. I wouldn't have put Vampiro against Dr. Death. You got to realize it's just like in boxing. I, think that, uh, I, I repeat that a lot. In boxing, styles make the fight. You know, like people say, well, how, he's going to win because he beat this guy in boxing. Well, that isn't necessarily so. If you look back in the alley era, it was probably the greatest time for uh, professional heavyweight boxing. And they all seemed to beat each other off. Do you know what I mean? One guy would, Zora Foley would beat Eddie Mach, and then Zora Foley would lose to Ernie Terrell, who Eddie Machen had beaten. And it was just, it just worked because of styles. I didn't think Dr. Death and Vampiro would help one another. Because you got to look out for that, too, you know. On paper, something sometimes looks really, really good. And then you say, oh, it was okay. It wasn't what I was thinking. And it's because of the style. Now, as far as the uh, Starcade pay-per-view, uh, it was Revolution was Shane, Asia, Malenko, and Saturn. Benoit wins the U.S. title later on in a great ladder match with uh, Jeff Jarrett. So it just shows you kind of where, where everyone is on the card. Benoit kind of positioned more as the leader of Revolution. Kind of was um, Shane is kind of the leader, but he's more the voice. Benoit is more the leader as far as kind of the one really getting the the, the bigger push of all those guys as far as Russo's booking. So Benoit, is, it's been kind of an upper mid carder. He's kind of climbing the card. Has there been some complaints from him that he didn't want to be top of the card and want to be U.S. champion? He wants to be in the main event. He wants to be the world champion or he doesn't talk like that or he never talked saying anything of that nature. I never heard him complain about his position. He knew he was The other guys thought that too, but there was no holding Chris or Eddie Ben back. They were going to get there because not only did they have matches together, the guys on top now have changed their opinion and wanted to work with them. So they would have been working with those guys six months down the road or three months. Oh, when, the, when we put the belt on Chris, he was going to work with Nash. Because I told him, you're going to have the belt for about six, eight months, and then I wanted you to do a thing with Nash where you guys kind of trade the belt off. 
Interesting. Now, now we'll get. To, I'm going to come back to that, but just to kind of talk about leading into sold out. So, what happens with with Russo? Because it's said that Bill Bush kind of demotes him. He has kind of stated that he kind of got tired of what was going on there, and he, he basically wanted to quit. He he still had his contract, so he was still obligated contractually to WCW. But it's around the beginning of 2000 in January where I guess Bill Bush steps in. Is he demoted and you're promoted? Did he quit? Like what happened there behind the scenes? Uh, truthfully, I don't know uh, Vince's situation. They just came to me and they said, we're going to make a change. And, uh, we'd like you to try it. I said, sure. I mean, we had all the talent in the world. We were on a pretty good run. And uh, that lasted for a while, a little while. So and when I, WCW sold out 2000 comes around, are you the, you're back again fully? You're the head booker? You're in charge? No, when WCW sold out? The 2000 oh, uh, pay-per-view uh, WCW sold out. That was uh, Vince and Eric, I believe. No, this is right when Russo leaves. So this is January oh, 2000. Yeah, that was yeah, this is right when he leaves. And So are you the head booker or is that not an official title? Yeah, well, it was my official title, yeah. Okay, so you're yeah. head booker. So all these injuries are going to kind of lead into the show. Bret Hart's the world champion. He's got post-concussion syndrome, not only from his matches with Goldberg, but people don't mention this when he was doing hardcore matches in uh, Texas and doing house show matches that were hardcore matches against Terry Funk. That probably didn't help the cause either. He didn't know what he had, but I'm sure that just being in those, you know, hardcore matches with Funk maybe didn't help, but obviously Goldberg kicked to the head, uh, then falling back on his head. If you watch the floor, when he puts on, um, if you watch that match at Starcade, when he goes to the floor, when he does his figure four on the post, uh, Brett Goldberg almost doesn't grab his leg. He hits his head on the floor. So, I mean, there's a couple things there where he definitely got some, some head injuries from Goldberg in that match, but maybe the funk matches leading up to sold out didn't help either. Jarrett's going to be out with a concussion. I believe it was Jimmy Superfly Snooker who made a surprise yeah. appearance on Nitro lands on Jarrett's head. It's all kind of one, it's one thing. It's like, man, that stinks because Jarrett's, you know, Oh, a, a top guy in the scene, uh, obviously uh, upper mid card, if not a main event. Bret Hart is the main event; he's a world champion. Does that kind of uh, just ruin everything? Because all these guys are getting hurt. I mean, Goldberg's getting hurt. All these guys are getting hurt. Yeah, and uh, you got to go back in time because nobody remembers this, or very few. The wrestlers remember; they were working three hundred days a year. How, you know, and I, people say to me, how did you guys do it? It was, to me, it was like being on a merry-go-round. You didn't realize it was spinning until you stepped off. And these guys were uh, working hurt, and they never got a chance to recover because back then we still had two towns running, you know what I mean? So you had to make the money while you could for the company. And that was a, you know, if you go back, John, I would say an average house, an average house was $300,000. You know, we go to Chicago, it was a half a million. Atlanta, it was a seven fifty. I mean. It's like uh, Kevin just lost a connection there. He'll be... Uh right back with us now we're talking about wcw sold out and kind of what's leading into that and all sorts of issues going on there with wcw russo kind of quits i guess it depends on who you ask and kind of where you're getting uh, the uh, info from but russo had said he was kind of getting sick and tired with what was going on in wcw he quits at that point Bill Bush kind of steps in and, and he's put in charge. So you're going to have uh, him kind of running the show. Um, and uh, he obviously demotes Russo, puts Kevin back in charge as the lead booker. So when you get into WCW sold out, like I mentioned with Kevin just a brief second ago, there's a lot of injuries going on. There's just a ton of, of craziness. 
Bret Hart, like I just said, is out with uh, post-concussion syndrome from his matches with Goldberg, but also from his matches uh, with Terry Funk before he realized what he really had. And he was you know, taking some shots to the head and some uh, trash can shots, chair shots, etc. Obviously, he didn't know uh, what he had. So then you've got Jeff Jarrett, who got a concussion on Monday Nitro when Snuka was coming in. They were doing, bringing him back kind of the old, old-timers to feud with Jarrett. And they were doing that whole thing with Jeff. So he gets a concussion. Goldberg gets injured with the whole Scott Hall scenario, punching a, a hole through, uh, not even a hole, just punching straight through a glass window of a car and ripping open, open his forearm. There's just uh, a lot of craziness going on in WWE. It was kind of unfortunate, too, because you had a little bit of, of momentum here just because I feel like Brett as champion was, was kind of where he should be, should be at the top of the card. He was trying to help WCW uh, step up and get to uh, the next level um, to really trying to help WCW get back to where they were, at least ratings wise, get, get back up and start getting back to where they needed to be. So you have Bill Goldberg out, you got Brett out, you've got uh, Jeff Jarrett out. So what do you do? And obviously, you know, you have some backstage turmoil with Benoit, and Saturn, and Guerrero, and Malenko, and maybe a little bit of Shane Douglas uh, sprinkled in there as well. Um, so you had some issues there backstage. You didn't know really what was going on. So really, this is a really tough time for Kevin Sullivan to step in again as head booker, especially with those guys being a little weary of him and not trusting uh, Kevin. Uh, Benoit, obviously, a lot of personal issues with him from Nancy, Nancy Sullivan, who becomes Nancy Benoit. So you had that whole issue. Obviously, they all have issues with Mike Graham. They have some issues with Kevin Nash. It's all kind of uh, been a, a little bit of trouble. Uh, Graham says that those guys couldn't draw. Obviously, you know, they had some backstage altercations. He's kind of proven wrong, obviously, on that. Nash has come back and took it, took away from what kind of what he said, but he was calling them vanilla midgets. Didn't know if he will want to, really want to work with them. Obviously, Kevin was saying he was going to have plans for Nash to work with Benoit. Kevin is back. All right, good. Um, I was just saying that there were some backstage issues with uh, Nash. Obviously, we mentioned before we mentioned Mike Graham had some issues saying that those four guys couldn't draw, and you know he didn't like those guys. And obviously, you know, um, with you know Nancy and the whole thing with Benoit and yourself, obviously maybe he had uh, some issues with you as well. So there's a lot of kind of turmoil and stuff, and the injuries being added to it just absolutely is just a killer. And the injuries just stinks. Because it's like, what are you going to do? You know, what could we do? We have to literally reshape the entire pay-per-view. How are we going to go about it? What are we going to do? So you kind of come up with a, a situation where you're going to really give uh, Kidman a gigantic push. Three matches that, in one night. That's when Eric had taken over. I wasn't involved in that, John. Oh, okay. But that that's sold out. This is when um, you're the head booker. But this was Bischoff? I, yes. Yes, that's when they came back. When Eric came back. Oh, was I thought the one, with Kidman, was the one with Kidman. Yeah, he fights uh, Malenko, then he fights Saturn, and then he fights the Wall. Okay, I was there for that one. I thought you meant the uh, one with Hogan. Oh no, no, no! That that would be months later, and obviously <laughs> that that pushed. Yeah. yeah. This, so this is uh, sold out two thousand. It kind of starts out with a catch this catch can match where the guys, it's like a, it really is a dungeon match, really. You're not supposed to leave the area. And I guess Malenko kind of screws up and backs up out of the ring. So the ref doesn't know what to do. He has to call for the bell. You're not allowed to leave the ring. So right. Kidman, he's going to win. Is that a screw up by uh, Malenko? Yeah, I think so. I mean, basically, guys make mistakes, and that's one of them. And good thing the referee, it could have been worse, you know what I mean? Then the, Announcers have to make up an excuse why. So, I mean, it can happen to anybody. So, why the decision to give Kidman out of everybody like the big push, you know, three matches on one night? They 
were preparing to put him with Hogan. There was some, Hulk said some stuff about Kidman that raised a lot of people's in that group, not the radicals, but a different group. Like Page was upset about it. Kidman was upset about it. Chris Canyon was upset about it. Some other people were upset about it. And I think that's where that came from was I think Page might have went to Hogan and said, uh, this kid needs to get pushed because it will help to fuse the situation. The interesting thing is... So, said about him? Yes, he couldn't draw at a flea market is what was one of his famous lines. Yeah, yeah. And that got back to them. And uh, it didn't set well with a lot of people. And I think Paige had a, a lot of pull. And Paige watched out for people. Paige is a good-hearted guy. And I think he went to Hogan and said, hey, you got to make this right. I think. I'm just assuming. Because in those days, would Hulk have worked with Billy Kidman or somebody in the being? Not a chance. Not a chance. Interesting so, that he kind of singles him out and, and says, hey, Billy Kidman couldn't draw at a flea market. I mean, out of all the guys, it's just, I know maybe it became not a big draw or whatever, but it's just interesting he Hulk singles him out. Yeah, and here's the thing. We all say things we don't mean sometimes. And you got to remember, too, uh, I'm not trying to put ideas in Hulk's head or words in his mouth. He was a heel at the time. I don't think because it wasn't said, I, I, I'm almost 100% sure on this, John. That's why I need your help here. He didn't say it on television. He said it on an interview somewhere on a radio show. Wasn't that it? Yes. And, you know, belittling anybody in your profession, especially a guy that busted his balls. Billy Kidman worked as hard as any of the guys. Billy was easy to get along with, and he was growing into his character. And I kind of think that hearing that, whether it was a work or a shoot, it, it didn't help Billy. And it didn't help the company and riled some people up. And at this point, you know, we got some, everybody's walking on thin ice anyway. We got factions going on. People are hurt. We need it all hands on deck. And you need to give it. And again, John, you said shit, I'm sure. I know I've done it my whole life. Sometimes I have to say myself. Do not say that. And as I'm saying to myself, do not say that. But the words are coming out of my mouth. And uh, it got, I know I'm being redundant, but as, I, as I'm processing it now, it got more heat as I go back and think about it than any of those guys needed. You know, they... They were heat magnets anyway because they were making so much money. And they had the, as, as you know, John, they had the most entertaining segments. So you didn't have to say that and be little, you know, an employee. It was, it was a bad thing and it caused a lot of damage. Yeah, I mean, that just you're like, right, he was on a radio show, Hulk just said he couldn't draw in a flea market. Funny line, but obviously maybe not needed, and uh, he definitely got some heat. So Kidman's going to get the big push at the show, kind of really, because it does completely show to see a revamp or redone with all the injuries we talked about. So he beats Malenko to kind of start the show. Malenko makes the mistake, leaves the ring. The ref has to call for it. Very short match. Obviously could have been great, could have been longer, but that gets cut short. He ends up beating Saturn. 
later on in, in the night as well. And then his third and final match, he loses to the wall in a cage match, but had a great showing and just showed you, wow, he, in his third match, he lost to a giant man who's just an absolute monster. Makes sense storyline-wise, and just keeps making the wall look good, too. And, hey, uh, like, one of, one of the guys that you don't hear a lot about is Dean Malenko. Dean Malenko is a second generation. His father was one of the greatest heels in the history of the wrestling business. Dean is a fabulous worker. Him and his brother were a staple in Japan as a tag team. They got trained by Carl Gotch. And Dean was one of the smoothest workers I've ever seen. Uh, I wish that never happened because the Kidman match and Dean would have set the tone for the night. You know, they would have had a, the match of the night, I think. What yep, do you think? I agree. I totally yeah. agree. Yeah. And I don't think uh, Dean Malenko ever got his due as a great worker that he is. Easily one of the greatest like technical wrestlers. Absolutely. Right. PWI wrestler of the year, 1997. So he got a little bit of recognition, but not a lot of where he could have. Right, right. The and interesting thing magazine giving you that that isn't like you know the general public knowing you know what i mean yep. i'm not belittling in the magazine but you know that magazine was really for hardcore wrestling fans right yeah pretty much yep yeah the thing it's fine i find interesting is benoit and it's, i'm sorry not benoit malenko Saturn and even Eddie Guerrero, because if you go back to Nitro, 11 22 99 before Eddie gets hurt, he ends up beating Kidman. But all three, Eddie, Dean, and Perry, the last three matches are all against Kidman. Just a funny kind of side note and a, and a weird little yeah. thing. Their final WCW matches, all three of those guys were against Kidman. Wow, that is unique. You know, it's like who would dunk it? Yeah, yeah. And, and here's the thing we're talking about Kidman. Kidman stayed up with those guys, and they were three of the most technical wrestlers on the ca card. You throw Malenko, I mean, you throw in Benoit, you get the four most technical guys in the in the business at the time, and Kidman stayed up with them. So that goes to show you what a talent Billy Kidman was. So really here, you got Chris Benoit in the main event against Sid Vicious for the vacant WCW world title because Bret Hart is injured, had to give it up. So Benoit is kind of going to take the place of, of Bret here versus Sid, and but it's going to be for the vacant title, obviously. So you're saying you took some hard kind of taking to get Sid to even agree to job to Benoit. Uh, what I'm saying is, John, go into a room with a guy 6'7", and his opponent's 5'7". The other guy's Jack 290. The other guy's 215. One guy has a huge contract. One guy got a very good contract. You're dealing with a guy that hasn't done a lot of jobs in his career. But it goes to show you the respect Benoit had and goes to show you that sometimes... People don't understand that some people uh, get stuck with bad labels. I always found Sid Vicious to be pro. Uh, when I went and talked to him, he he was man enough to say, I don't think I, this is the right thing to do it in front of Benoit. Uh, I said, well... I really need to get this belt on Benoit. And he said, well, I don't think it's the right thing, but if you're asking me to do it, I'm going to do it. I said, I'm asking you to do the favor, please. And he said, yeah, I'll do it. I trust you. So he went out and put Benoit over. And if you remember, he tapped out. With Arn Anderson as the ref and with his foot under the rope, is that just uh, just a, a, just in case something happened? Why was Sid's foot under the rope? Is that a safety precaution there? That was a fail safe for me. I mean, I, I was as this match before the match was going on, there was a lot of stuff happening, and uh, I told Sid, I just want 
in case we need a backup plan, put your foot underneath the rope. I didn't think we were going to need the backup plan, but lo and behold, we did. Now, why the failsafe? Because of all the issues with Benoit? Yeah, not just Benoit, the, the whole thing, you know, I mean, this wasn't one night that they decided, you know, they didn't want me, Graham, Nash, JJ, you know, they wanted a purge of the office. This wasn't just one night they decided it, you know, they didn't talk about it and then their attitude was a little different. And I just thought, well, you know, this got to appease everybody that he's winning the belt, but in case something happens, I got an out here. I don't want the guy appearing in the WWE like Flair did as, you know, WCW World Heavyweight Champion. So did he beforehand say, because it's been said by a few people, I don't know if Malenko said it or not, but Bruce Pritchard said it. Sometimes Bruce Pritchard's not the most honest person. Who knows how he would even know this anyway, but was it told to you from Benoit he did not want to win the title? No. Who Bruce Pritchard said that? There was, I, th I think on his podcast, I think he does it on purpose. He just embellishes some stories. Uh, I think he said he heard it secondhand. Obviously, he wouldn't know. But I think Malenko might have said it in an interview as well where he said, oh, I don't think Benoit wanted to win the title. Is, is that true at all? If it was, it was unbeknownst to me. He never said it, you know. So it's possible he said it to Dean, but he really never he never expressed it to you, right? Possible. I uh, I would think that Dean wouldn't come out and say that unless there was some truth to it. But he didn't didn't say it to me. And then when Sid said he didn't want to do the job, that would have been the perfect opportunity to say, okay, you don't want to do the job, I'll put you over, put Sid in a bad position. But he didn't. So when Benoit wins, it, he immediately. With you, is there any sort of like, hey, you're you know you're happy you should be you should be appeased now? Uh, is he oh. kind of pretending to be happy? Is he saying I don't want, even want to be champion? What happens when he wins the title? I said thank you very much. Uh, we're going to do business, and I'm going to have you work with Nash and trade the belt six eight months down the line. And that was the last I ever saw from Benoit. Interesting thing is with with that you think he would be happy. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they were kind of complaining that they weren't getting their spots, weren't getting pushed. And I know you said they weren't happy with the office. They want a complete redo. But he's the champion now, so he is the top guy. That is what they wanted, isn't it? Well, here's something that no one has ever talked about. When they walk in, Bruce Pritchard, I'm sure, hasn't talked about this. When they walked over, they were given the keys of the kingdom. They had together gone into the office and got a huge raise, the four of them. And I remember Eric telling people he's never going to do collective bargaining again. Where do you have the confidence that you're making seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year that you can walk over to another company and do as well, if not better, and have a straight line unless you've been talking to them for a while. That's you know, if, if I was a lawyer I'd bring that question up. Right? I mean, seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year in two thousand is a lot of money. It's a lot of money today. And they walked over and they were featured immediately. So it wasn't that everybody on WWE didn't know how talented they were. But are you going to rock the boat at this period? Unless you've talked to guys. I think what I'm saying is they were so desirable that I think WWE would have matched anything we gave them and gave them more merchandise and everything else. But there had to be some talks there, I would think. Would you? Uh, honest, it would lead to yes or lean towards yes, just because it was a pretty smooth transition to get quickly over there, uh, literally within two weeks. 
Right. Right. Just right. seemed to. Uh, and, and they didn't miss a page. Right. So. Have, have Bruce ask that question. <laughs> And it's funny, too, because Bruce will state some things like about the four jumping and how uh, they didn't want uh, Benoit. They just want, or, excuse me. They didn't want Shane Douglas because he's the fifth member uh, of the revolution who was in with them complaining and wanting a push and this and that. And and obviously uh, he doesn't jump. He come, ends up coming back to WCW. That's a little bit of a surprise. But Jim Ross, who obviously is the head of talent relations at that point, states Shane Douglas. Originally, he was talking to him about jumping and that Shane got advice from his lawyer, whoever said don't go wb and, and shane obviously if, if anybody knows shane very staunchly against that wb since dean douglas but um jr said that shane didn't come over with with his own thing bruce has another story where he's saying oh we didn't want him and jr's like well i was the head of talent i know who we were going to bring in at that time and we, we were thinking about bringing shane so is there any was there any kind of thought of okay we're going to lose shane douglas as well uh you know i'm not sure but doesn't Shane tell a story where they all had made this blood pack and they were all going together? And tell the story. Yeah, so Shane says they all basically agreed together that either they would go stay in WCW together or they would go to WF together. Whatever they're going to do, they're going to decide. They're going to decide together. But obviously, he was never talking to WWF, and it seems like maybe somebody, maybe all four, maybe somebody of the four, was it was a ringleader talking to WWF because it seemed like he wasn't a part of that, and he called the hotel and he gave the name of, of Dean Malenko. He's not staying at the hotel, so then I guess I get, maybe he was, oh yeah, yep. Didn't Russo tell him to call the hotel? Yes, so Russo kind of tipped him off. Somehow Russo knew. I know he's obviously got friends in both places, and obviously he's friends with Shane, but you're right. Vince Russo told him to call that hotel because, hey, I heard probably from somebody that he was still friendly with WWE. He, uh, I heard that you know they're at this hotel. Shane shockingly calls, and Malenko was there under an alias that Shane knew because Shane would stay in hotel rooms with Dean, and he would use an alias. It was his real name, right. Shelly. So, so Shelly Simon. Yep. Yeah, didn't he call him on his uh, cell phone first? I don't know if if it was a cell phone thing first, or if his or if he called and his wife picked up or something. I thought Shane said that he called. And Malenko said that he was at his brother's beach house. Yes, you're right. Um, um, yes, he said yes because Malenko flat out lies to him and says that. Yes. Yep. So that's why Shane didn't go. I imagine, right? Yes, and uh, he he actually was kind of getting together before them, saying that oh, I don't know if we should jump. I don't I don't know about you know going to the WBF. I don't know if we have a spot there. Obviously, those guys knew better. They knew they had a spot there, and they just didn't clue him in. Yeah. It seems to me this kind of verifies what you and I were talking about, that there had to be talks before it, and unfortunately Shane wasn't involved in the talks. And it's they're saying as of summer 99, when Raven kind of made that stink and quits WCW, when Bischoff had that big meeting with everybody, anybody has a problem with what we're doing, it, it, it supposedly kind of formed then that they got some, not feelers, but let's just say they got the uh, feeling of, of maybe wanting to leave even as of summer of 99. Did you hear that or were you aware of that? I, I could see how that happens because I've always enjoyed being around Raven and I think he's a brilliant guy, and I think his talent is fabulous. And he's smart enough to know that he could go someplace else, and he wouldn't just say that, you know what I mean, walk out of a meeting. So obviously there was something going on back then too. Yes. Now... When Benoit wins the title at, at sold out, does he leave the world heavyweight title behind? Like, what is the story with the actual title? Does he go to the office and drop it off? Like, what, what's, what kind of, what happens after that? I think he went to the office. Or he might have stayed in the town and gave the belt up. I'm not, can't remember that. So you're not a part of kind of getting, making sure that the title isn't head no. elsewhere? I mean, it was in his possession, you know, and he won the belt. 
Mm -hmm. But he did the right thing. I think he gave it to Bill Bush or Gary Just. I'm not sure. It is interesting, though, because those four guys, it seemed like, especially with all those injuries, were definitely in prime position to get a push. Like you said, uh, when Eddie came back, you were going to you know, maybe make him U.S. champion or something when he came no, back from injury. He had been U.S. champion. In the past, but at this point, he's injured. So, I mean, whenever he comes back, you do have a spot for him. How can you not have a spot f for Eddie? You know right. what I mean? Any of those guys, how could you not have a spot? You know, it's managing a baseball team or a football team. Talent, this is a talent-driven business. You can't have those guys, those four or five guys, leave and not have a boulder size so whole in your TV and your towns. I mean, that's a that that was the down beginning of the downfall of maybe not the beginning, but that was the coup de grace of WCW. Do any of these four guys, um, maybe maybe the three, we'll just say Perry, Saturn, Eddie, or Dean. Do any of those three guys have an issue with you that they take up to with you to your face? Like, do they get it? Is there any no. sort of like thing where you you know something is up or no? No. And at this point, Benoit, was there any issues with you and him face to face? No, we're good. We're good. Interesting. So it's almost like I don't know. Maybe they're being quiet for a reason. Maybe they know they're they're headed somewhere else. Yeah, uh, it, and they really disliked Mike Graham, and they really didn't like JJ, and obviously they didn't like me. But <laughs> Mike really could get under their skin, and this goes back way back when. Malenko's father tried to run opposition in Florida against Mike's dad. So there had been heat for generations there. And Mike probably carried that. And Mike wasn't above saying, you know, can't throw a dime, he can't throw a dime. You know, I loved Mike, but he was outspoken. You know, Mike was not the greatest diplomat of all times, and he'd let you know, and his vibe would let you know. So, I don't know where the heat was with JJ. I understand where the heat was with me, but none of them ever came to me and said, you know. And that's why I think they had a place ready to go. Because if you think about it, sold out is January 16th, 2000. They debut on Raw on January 31st, 2000. And it's just like, wow, two weeks. Legally speaking, I know WWE does it. Does WCW not have contracts where you have to have 90 days in between? No, does they, WCW? They, they gave them their unconditional release. Wow. Now, Why would all, they do that? Yeah. First of all. I don't think that that 90-day clause would hold up in a real court of law. In the Constitution, it says you can't deprive a man of making a living. It doesn't say the length of time. That would be a debatable question. And what's going on now in politics about WWE and any other wrestling company, right? Uh, if it says in the Constitution you can't deprive a man of making a living, if you go to court, they get tons of any company, any place. It just doesn't be wrestling. It could be anything. When I sold my gym, I had a five-year non-compete clause, too, and a certain mileage. But it'd be hard to go to court and say, well, I can't work for 90 days, and these are my bills. But what they're going to do is they're going to get a team of lawyers and appeal, appeal, appeal. And it's going to cost you your life savings. I mean, I went through a lawsuit on something else one time. And uh, I won right out. And then I went to two appeals, which cost me mid uh, six figures. I ended up winning, but 
you know, it was a four year process. So, yeah, that's like uh, Todd Gordon was telling me about the ECW library. Easy open and shut case. He gets the library from, I think it was like 92, 93, 94. He gets to own it. No, when WB got involved, appeal, appeal, appeal. He ended up spending so much money on lawyer fees and this and that. He's like, you know what? Technically, I could win, but I would end up losing in the end because you'll lose all the money. Right. So, right. yeah. Right. You got to, you know, when you get in those kind of lawsuits, you got to say to yourself, okay, how much money do I want to spend? Is it worth it? I don't know. I don't see it being worth it when, you know, you're going against, hey, for some reason, Turner never fought lawsuits. And they would just roll over and pay. I, I, uh, I've been deposed, deposed by uh, Jerry McDivitt, you know, Vince's lawyer. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have teams of lawyers, and they're very, very bright, as you can imagine. I don't think... You can ever win, uh, I'm not going to say ever, but the chance of a single person going against a major corporation and beating them with lawyers is uh, almost very tale. So Benoit is the, oh, he's really on ground, but I mean, he's the WCW world champion. He's going to drop off the belt. Now the title is vacated again. Does this really kill you as the booker? Because not only all those injuries, Brett doesn't really lose the title. Benoit is not going to lose the title. I know you still have Sid and Nash that are going to be the, the kind of still in the main event. But, man, does that kill you that, that these guys were leaving and now you have to have another vacated world title? Don, you're a baseball fan, right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. I'm fielding a center fielder, a third baseman, a first baseman, and a... Uh, Catcher and a one armed pitcher. If a guy hits the ball up the middle, it's inside the park home run, right? It hurt us big time. It hurt us big time. And it hurt us when you look what they did when they went to WWE. One of the best feel good moments of all times of wrestling is Eddie and Chris winning the titles. Definitely. WrestleMania 20, yep, definitely. Yeah, so it, it was too bad it couldn't be done at WCW, but, you know, fate got in the way, I guess. So when they leave, you kind of mention it uh, all the way at the top of the hour. You're saying that was a part of, of like the death of WCW. Do you think that it them leaving those four guys who had been pushing WCW for years, you know, slowly up the card and they were slowly making, obviously Ben Wobbe was the world champion, so he's top of the mountain. Is that just totally leading to the death of WCW, losing those four guys? Because they were pure WCW guys. They were built in WCW. Yeah, it was the beginning of the end. And they were the glue. That when you did a TV, then all you had to do in the left hand column was put Malenko, Benoit, Ferrero, Satin, and Douglas on one side of the column in single matches. And you could fill anybody, not anybody, but you could fill the right hand column. And you knew you were going to have at least a three and a half star match. That's hard to fill. That's hard to fill. And nobody that is a booker wants to go through that hole. Nobody, nobody, nobody. You swallow your ego, your pride, whatever you need to do if you want the company to run well, if you want the business to do well. You don't want that to happen because you know, unless you're, uh, I don't know, who could have fixed it? But I don't know anybody that could have fixed that hole. That's, that is, we hit the iceberg, but now we had scraped it in the bottom of the hole. The water started pouring it. You know, it's just what I just said. Just think what I just said. Get a piece of paper, write those names down, and look at the, the list of guys we had back then. You could put any of them, whether it was Billy Kidman, Raven, uh, Vampiro, Conan, Disco. I mean, you just could go down the line. You know you're going to have an incredible match. Now, 
you, you losing five of them. We ended up losing four, but you lose five, we'll say. Boy, that's an hour off your program you've lost. Tell me how you can rectify that. And you're right, four, four of the best workers, four guys that are going to be having the ever, best matches. Ever. It wasn't that just that era, ever. You know? So, you know, you mentioned uh, Benoit, and, and did you ever actually try to talk him into staying, or there's none of that kind of interaction? I, what, the last thing we ever said, I said, congratulations, this is the plan, see you tomorrow. And there was no tomorrow. Oh, no. Unfortunately. It's so interesting that they're, you know, going to be on TV two weeks later, and they get the unconditional release, which you said. Don't you think in retrospect, like, WCW smartly should have said no to an unconditional release? Maybe get give them a release, let them quit, but make, make them sit out for as long as possible? First of all, Bill Bush was a very nice man. He had just gotten the job. And Bill had been an accountant, and he knew that Turner gave in to any threat of a lawsuit. I think there's like a, when I was there, I, and I, this is a figure, you know, please don't lock me in this figure, but I think I heard a figure one time, 157 lawsuits. He never defended one of them. Bill had just slipped into that position too. That's how I got in the position, but Bill got the position, said, Look back at history and says, let's try Kevin. Now, Bill gets the job. He's brand new, running the company. Does he want to have a lawsuit where he knows the company's going to cave? You better take definitely. the licks. Definitely what? Not. He yeah. definitely wouldn't want a lawsuit. Yeah, so they would have. And I'm sure it could have been Jerry McDivitt's uh not him himself, but he could have directed them to a uh, big time lawyer like uh, John John Taylor, uh, the famous lawyer in Atlanta that beat Turner like forty times in a row. You know that was Vince's lawyer in Atlanta. I mean, I, I think Bill was smart enough to say, "Uh oh, I just took the job over. I got." Four guys leaving, and now if I block them, they're going to sue me, and we're going to cave anyway. You know, he's he's just pissing in the wind at that point. He's going to get it all over himself. So they debut on TV. What are your thoughts? Are you watching Raw at all? Do you see this? Do no. you hear about it? How do you hear yeah. about it? Yeah. Well, I knew they were going to end up. I knew they weren't going to ECW. I knew they'd end up with us. With I mean, WWF. I knew, and I knew they'd be successful. I mean, every one of them I pushed, so I knew they were going to be successful. And it was the first time that a group of guys left and went there with their stature. A group. You know, Rick had gone over, Luger had gone over, but there was a lot of time in between the few guys we lost. It wasn't like Hall and Nash and then the floodgate happened for us. And it's, to me anyway, I don't, and I have never heard anybody say this or, or, or whatever. I'm sure they've noticed it, but so Steve Austin, their biggest star of all time, but obviously in that era, not Kenny Hogan, but saying the biggest star there and up to that, that era, I mean, he's the biggest star of that era for them. He gets injured in late 99, doesn't return until late 2000. So, between him getting injured and a few months later getting those four guys, it's almost like they got a huge injection of talent when they really, really needed it. Because Undertaker was injured a little bit at that point. Austin was injured. And you get four guys, especially the WWE World Champion, and you get them to jump. I mean, that's just such a monumental big shift. Kind of, I think uh, people are missing the 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 boat on that one that they needed those guys at that point. Cause WBF, they had stars, they had the rock, they had triple H and they had, you know, DX and stuff, but they needed an injection of, of top talent to really help them. Yeah. And they got it too. I mean, we've, we've done nothing but sing their praises. They got it and rightfully so. I mean, they did a great job with them. 
The thing is, they're called the Radicals. I don't really know about that name being that great, but you know they'll they'll debut. Malenka will lose to X Pac, of course. They do. You know the WWF has got to beat the WCW guys. Triple H ends up beating Benoit. A little controversial, but he beats him. The Outlaws, Road Dog, and, and Billy they beat um, Malenko and Saturn. So it's one of those things. Of course, subtly, Vince has to have WCW lose WWF, right? I mean, it's just par for the course. Right. Right. Eventually, eventually, I mean, they'll um, they'll turn heel on Foley and they'll get contract stuff. But it just seems like Vince always needs to do that, shouldn't they? Have, I don't know. When you debut the guys, eventually, I mean, they should be winning at first and building them up, right? Like you did with the NWO. Uh, that's where uh, I agree with you. But maybe it was. Uh, let's see what their attitude is. And the main thing, though, the main thing is, John, as you know, he beat WCW. He had to beat the drum and show that WWE was a superior product. Then after they got integrated into WWE, they became the stars they are. Yep, very true. Any regrets, kind of looking back, anything you wish you would have handled differently, done differently? I don't, I've thought about it a lot. I don't know what I could have done. More than put a world title belt on somebody. Is there anything that you wish you could have said to those guys? Like, hey, you know, uh, let's try to work out a deal. Or that's not really your department as, as far as that. Because they did get a better deal. But is there any sort of like backroom stuff where they were, I don't know, like somebody could have said something to them or somebody could have sweetened the pot. But I guess not really, right? Because you're saying they got a, they got a raise. They were they went from whatever their money was, all four of them at seven fifty. Wow. Crazy. Yeah. Absolutely crazy. Now, uh, as we kind of uh, just wind this one down and finish it up, what's kind of your just your final thoughts when you think about the radicals, really the revolution, and Eddie, of course, jumping ship from WCW to the WWF. Like, what's the kind of final thought? That's the nail in the coffin. That that just sucks. I mean, what's the kind of final thought on that? In a retrospect, they did the right thing because if they were there when Vince bought it out, they wouldn't have the leverage that they did. It was good for them. That's a good point. I didn't even think about that. That's true, because if they would have waited a year and, and Vince bought him out, who knows what would have happened. Right. They could have got lost in the shuffle, like Buff yep. did. Very true. Now, as far as some plugs, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Two Man Power Trip. You can go to my website, tmptempire.com, for all the latest and greatest from all the podcasts going on. Of course, you can follow Kevin on Instagram at Taskmaster Talks. Go to Pro Wrestling Tees.com, type in Kevin Sullivan. You can see Kevin Sullivan's wonderful t shirt store. And speaking of t shirt stores, an even more wonderful one is a Double Hell t-shirt. you got so many cool designs, so many cool t-shirts from Double Hell. So I highly recommend everyone go to Double Hell t-shirts and check out Kevin Sullivan on there as well. Kevin, anything else you got going on? Oh, not for the middle of the month in uh, November, but we'll talk about that later. Thank you very much, John. Yes. Now, Kev, of course, you know, this has been another a great edition of the Taskmaster Talks. And, and going forward, we'll get into a lot of interesting and intriguing topics for sure. The Radicals jumping ship is, is one of the ones that I know so many people wanted to talk about because they're just, you know, they're so curious about, you know, why they left on top. You know, they why you left WCW when you could have had, you know, the run of the land. You could have been on top of the world. Right. And, and who knows? Who knows? If they didn't leave, who knows? Maybe uh, they don't end up selling. Who knows what the future would have happened? Yeah, that's true. But like I said, they made the right decision for them because he bought it out a year later. And I think it was going to happen eventually, whether it was a year, a year and a half. Vince was going to resolve it because by this time, AOL didn't want wrestling. Very true. Now, everybody, thank you for joining us this week and every week right here on Taskmaster Talks with Kevin Sullivan. Thank you, everybody. See you next week, folks. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews, 
match videos, or news updates. Support us on Patreon.com for $1.99 a month to watch our full shoot interviews ad-free and help our channel grow. Follow us on Twitter at The Hannibal TV for instant updates.